Hi, welcome to my new video. So today in this video, I would like to talk about grain boundaries, which are basically a topic which is a rabbit hole. A rabbit hole is basically a metaphor for something that transports someone into a wonderfully or troublingly surreal state or situation. So without further ado, let's jump into grain boundaries. So before we learn what are grain boundaries, we need to understand what are grains. And these grains can be visible also in your day to day life. For example, in this case, which is an electrical pole, which has been galvanized and you see these weird shapes, which are separated, seemingly separated. And these individual shapes are called grains. Each of them is a grain. You can also see them in some metals without any special processing. And uh, here you can see some grains in a piece of aluminum alloy. And for example, in this case, you see grains, but now at a really small scale of 10 to 20 microns. And these grains can be even smaller in the range of nanometers. And these are basically nanocrystalline alloys or metals. Now, what is actually a grain? So within a grain, you usually have atoms. And these atoms are arranged in a specific way. And within this particular grain, all the atoms will have this particular orientation. And to denote this orientation, we usually use a small representation in the form of a unit cell. And we say that this is how the unit cell is oriented, meaning that this is how the atoms are oriented inside this particular grain. So each grain here is basically has a certain orientation, which is represented by the small representative unit cell. In this case, you have a different orientation. In this case, you have a different orientation. But mind that these are all same atoms. It's just that within this region, these atoms are oriented in one particular way, whereas here they are in a different way, and so on. However, just knowing the orientation is not enough. We have to define it. It's like asking for directions when you don't know what is north, when is what is south, what is east, what is west. So in order to do that, we usually come up with an orthogonal axis for each of the unit cells. So these we call the crystalline directions. And these are usually along major crystallographic directions which are perpendicular to each other. For example, in a cubic case, we choose axes which are along 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 0. These are all mutually perpendicular to each other. And then we need a set of axes which are also, we choose them to be orthogonal. And these are the axes which can be x, y, z, it can be east, south, and up. It can be also rolling direction, transverse direction, and normal direction. It can also be the axis of the laboratory room in which you are working. But we just need a fixed coordinate axis. And then, with respect to this coordinate axis, we define how these crystalline axes are. So how do we give the orientation? For example, once we have defined set of axes for both our lab and also for our crystal, we project them and we measure, for example, in this case, angles between these axes, right? Then we have basically three angles, alpha, beta, gamma, or small x, small y, small z. And all three angles give us the orientation of this particular cube or this particular grain with respect to the axes which we have defined. So in order to define orientation of one particular cube, we need three angles. Now let's see what is actually a grain boundary. So let's assume that these two small unit cells now start to grow. Once they grow, they have to meet at a certain point, And then the region between them or the boundary between these two grains is then called a grain boundary. So how do we define a grain boundary? Naturally, we have to talk about the orientation of these two grains. And instead of talking about orientation of these two grains with respect to a fixed laboratory axis, since now we are talking about a grain boundary, we can talk about something called misorientation. That is, we look how much the orientation of one grain varies with respect to the other. And we do this in a similar way. That is, we project the axis of this green grain onto the axis of the blue grain, and then we measure the angles. So now we have measured the misorientation of the green grain with respect to the blue grain. But of course, that is just not enough 
to define a grain boundary. What we also need to define is a grain boundary plane. And in order to see what it means, let's look at these things in 2D. Let's say that two grains have intersected each of them, that is they have penetrated within each other. And now we have to define a grain boundary plane. That is, I can cut this grain along this particular line, then this would be the grain boundary plane, or along this, or along this, or along this. While I am not changing the orientation of the grain itself, the misorientation between these two grains is still the same, but what I am changing is this direction along which I cut them. Meaning, if I cut along this particular line or this particular plane in three dimensions, this is how the grains would look like. And this would be our grain boundary plane. Similarly, if I cut along this particular line, then again, this is the grain boundary. So we haven't changed the orientation. However, we have changed the plane. So this means that basically these two grains, while they were growing, they met along this plane. That's why this became the grain boundary. Whereas when these two grains were going here, they met along this plane. So this became the grain boundary plane. And in order to define the plane, we need a vector, which is a unit vector normal to the grain boundary plane. And since we don't really need Miller indices to do this, we just need a unit vector along the normal to the grain boundary plane, we have this um, uh, this particular relation which is valid whereas h square plus k square plus l square is equals to 1 square right which means that if we know two of them the third one is already known because they all need to sum up to one because it's a unit vector so we need two degrees of freedom or two variables to define the grain boundary plane normal and three angles to define the misorientation so in all, we have this five mic macroscopic degrees of freedom to define a grain boundary. So to define a grain boundary, we need at least five macroscopic degrees of freedom. But now let's see what happens when we slightly move the grain boundary. That is, we have defined this grain boundary plane. And let's say I slightly shift the grain two or the green grain along this direction. Then I haven't changed the misorientation between two grains. I haven't changed the grain boundary plane. However, I have slightly moved, meaning locally at atomic scale, the environment must have changed. So if we look at the grain boundary plane now, which is shown here, I have two additional degrees of freedom, which is these two translation directions. So we have two translation directions inside the grain boundary plane, which can affect the atomistic environment in the grain boundary plane. And not only that, I can try to move the grain boundary by either adding more atoms inside this plane or removing atoms from this plane. That is, I can move these two grains further apart by including more vacancies here. Even this does not change the macroscopic degrees of freedom that is it does not change the misorientation it does not change the grain boundary plane however the local atomic environment of the grain boundary itself should have changed so this gives us one more degree of freedom so we have three additional microscopic degrees of freedom for a grain boundary so we saw that uh, the five macroscopic degrees of freedom even though they are not changing the three microscopic degrees of freedom can change the atomistic environment of a grain boundary. And it becomes really important that we come up with a model to describe the atomistic environment of the grain boundary itself rather than the five mi macroscopic degrees of freedom. In order to identify the atomistic model or atomistic description of these grain boundaries, we move away from this unit cell representation and now we look at how the atoms themselves are arranged in a lattice. So we look at the atoms arrangement inside the green grain at the grain boundary with respect to how atoms are arranged inside the red grain at the grain boundary. Of course, if the red grain uh, atoms positions are exactly on top of green grain lattice positions, uh, 
we basically do not have green boundary because it has the same structure so now instead of laying them over on top of each other let's rotate the red lattice and when we are doing so you see that at certain rotation angles there are some patterns which are coming up which actually indicate that there are certain positions which are common to both red and green grains that is the lattice positions of red lattice and also for the green lattice they sometimes coincide and we can use this particular concept to describe our green boundary so now let's look at one particular such rotation that is the rotation of the red lattice on top of green lattice and this particular rotation angle is around 36.9 degrees and when we do so we have some points which are coincident with green lattice i'm playing this again so that you can see this clearly how a red lattice point comes on top of a green lattice point and this is what happens everywhere around here these points and we can identify these points and i have marked them here in blue which are basically the coincident sites between the green lattice and the red lattice and now using these coincidence points we can again form a lattice and this lattice is called coincidence site lattice or often abbreviated as CSL to describe a green boundary and for this particular CSL what we see is that for every five red points that is for every five red lattice we have a coincidence with the green lattice similarly for every five green points we have a coincidence lattice or coincidence site with the red lattice this we represent by a number called sigma for example in this case the coincidence site lattice has a sigma value as 5 because for every 5 lattice points we have a coincidence site so this coincidence site lattice model has become very important in describing a green boundary atomistically but as we saw previously we can also have some translations inside the green boundary plane that is now that we have the sigma 5 green boundary and these are the coincident site or coincident sites between the green and red lattice we can see what happens when we try to translate our boundary and there are certain special translations that is if i now translate my red lattice for this particular distance in this direction what happens is that the, green, the red lattice moves on to the green and we again have a lattice forming with coincident sites now here and again this coincident site lattice has a value of sigma which is 5 so by doing this particular translation we again ended up with a sigma 5 boundary so if we map all such translation vectors which again give us a sigma 5 boundary or which again give us the CSL lattice with the same sigma value we get a new lattice and this lattice is called a displacement shift complete lattice or a DSC lattice so these models of CSL and DSC become really important to define green boundaries as it has been shown that even green boundaries can exhibit phase transformations and usually they exist as separate phases called complexions and these complexions are usually separated by defects 1d defects which are usually called disconnections which are basically dislocations but in the dsc lattice and i would highly recommend that you read this particular paper where they show that the green boundaries can exhibit these phase transformations and i will provide the link in the description so i hope I was able to um, uh, create a small understanding of this green boundaries with this particular video. If you have any doubts, please reach out to me and uh, thank you for watching my video.